So um, I, I'm happy to talk about sort of how I got to where I, where I am today. Um, it would be a little bit different, I think, for all of you, just because there's a little bit more competition in the fields of, of biology and marine science. Um, that doesn't mean it's not tangible by any means. Um, and I'll probably talk about it at the end. So Claire likes to have me talk about sort of those things. The last time I came, I showed up with um, Gary Davis, um, who I think occasionally gives lectures here. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So have any of you seen a lecture by Gary Davis? We have some, he's given some departmental seminars in the past, and we have some of those on, I believe, our website, not our YouTube channel, but our website. But he actually, um, he started the Gulf Force Wildlife Program at Shadows National Park, and I'll talk about the history of the program and inventory and monitoring in the Park Service a little bit. Um, I'm going to touch on a whole lot of things. So I'm going to use what I'm most familiar with, which is this long-term mo monitoring data set, the Gulf Force Monitoring, um, MPA. So I'm going to kind of bring in things that I think are appropriate for this class at any time. Um, you could ask me questions, interrupt me, ask me to clarify, ask me to speak more clearly, um, tell me you have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, usually that's me, the old guy that has to go first, but sometimes when I start talking, I don't stop. Maybe not quite as bad as Sean. But, but, um, so with, with that, I'll, I'll just go ahead and start, but I kind of do it kind of freelance, and I'm going to go off on a few tangents. And I added in, typically I run about two hours, and Everybody told me I can have a full three hours if there's not, not available. And so I kind of added a few extra things, and I got a different talk at the end that's talking about um, invasive algae, which is sort of incorporated here. But I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll kind of propose a question toward, towards the class, and maybe try and get your opinion on what the Park Service and agencies should do with a new invasive species in the islands. So I'll kind of give you a little bit of a challenge. Um, if you're falling asleep, um, luckily I don't know your names. <laughs> but I might say you in the corner fall asleep, or you inside fall asleep, wake up. Um, I mean that, but I try, I'll try and engage you. Um, with that, I need to know how many of you have been to the Channel Islands? Raise your hand. Okay, so a few of you have. Um, how many of you, a back group was at Santa Rosa and not at the other islands? Raise your hand. You mean only been to Santa Rosa? Only, uh, well, well, Santa Rosa one of Okay, so a lot of you have not been to the, the, the UCB search station. So what islands have you been to? Santa Cruz or Anna Kappa? Raise your hand. Well, I'm curious. Who, who's not been to our research station on Santa Rosa? Most of you guys have not been to the research station? We went as a class. Yeah, you guys went as a class, okay. right? All right, yeah. so you guys just aren't speaking up. All right, got it. <laughs> got it. All right, so I saw a lot of hands raised for the Channel Islands, so a lot of those were Santa Rosa, correct? All right. All right. I just, I kind of need to know the background and, and figure out what I think that you can relate to and, and how I speak and what I talk about. All right, how many of you are scuba divers? Raise your hand. Okay. So one, two, three, four. How many of you have snorkeled? Raise your hand. Okay, a lot more. How many of those, so raise your hand if you've snorkeled. All right, lower your hand if it hasn't been in the kelp forest. So only in tropical water. All right, so about half the hands went down. So a lot of you are diving in, in the warm water situations. Warm water is a lot more friendly. A lot of people don't dive in cold water. Sorry. The rest of you that haven't done that, snorkel or scuba dive in cold water, you're missing out on one of the most beautiful places on the planet. I encourage you to do so. Um, and the underwater world is, is two-thirds of the planet. So that's my little pitch for seeing the underwater world, and it really is a totally different perspective than on land. And I'll try and make some, some, some relationships there. So I've been working in the park since 1990. <clears throat> I started as a seasonal biological technician for a couple of years, working on the Kelp Forest Monitoring Program, which I will go into more detail as I talk this through. Um, I applied to grad school, got accepted, at a time um, where the economy wasn't very good, and none of my friends were coming out with, ma out with masters and PhDs that had to find a job. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of kept my job and sort of kept on going and never really left. That's a short story of where I am today. Um, so the five park islands, so there's, there's eight islands off of <coughs> the coast of California. There's also several more down off Baja. And um, I think you, most of you probably know this, but Catalina is privately owned. A lot of this is the Nature Conservancy, the Kevin Island Conservancy, which runs it very similarly to the Park Service. Um, Exactly by the San Nicolas of Um And they're actually pretty good um, environmental stewards of those islands. They try pretty hard to do a pretty good job. And they're way better, better funded than the park services. And then Santa Barbara and Kathy, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, and San Miguel are um, areas of the park service. And Santa Cruz is about two thirds owned by the Nature Conservancy, which is a private institution, or a nonprofit organization that has a very similar mission as, as the park service does. And then the park extends out. Um, one mile from the islands. And I'll talk more about the jurisdictions in the marine world as, as we go on. So um, I'm only going to show a few slides on the terrestrial environment, but here is um, San Miguel Island, really incredible pristine beach in Kyler Harbor, 
lots of native plants and vegetation there, much more than the other islands, um, in large part because it's got a shorter history of, of grazing activity. So there are ranchers and ranching activities on all the islands. Um, San Miguel, there was a lot less intense ranching and the animals were removed um, a long time ago in the 50s. And so that island's recovered dramatically, like we're seeing the other islands recover. Um, Santa Rosa <laughs> Island is, is um, another large island, most of uh, them have been there. Um, if one of you can tell me what's wrong with this photo, you'll get a brownie point at the end. I'm not sure what that might be, but you'll get a brownie point. <laughs> we'll tell, it'll be on video, so Claire will get it. So <laughs> Amy, tell me, what's, tell me what's wrong with this video. I'll orient you yourself a little bit. There's the pier right there. A little bit blurry. It's an old photo. Anybody guess what's wrong with that photo? You got it. Brownie point. Exactly. Here's the Torrey Pines, which are supposed to be over there. So back in the old days, we didn't have digital cameras. This is an old slide. <coughs> it's an actual old slide. And sometimes you scan a slide, and it'll be reversed. And so that, that's just the reverse photo on the slide. All right. On land, uh, that's it for terrestrial stuff. I'm going to sort of, well, this next slide is going to sort of go down in the ocean. But on land, uh, there's over, well over 2,000 species on the islands, plants and animals. There's well over 105 that are endemic, and we're learning about more and more endemic species, such as ants and other, and other species, as time goes on. So there's lots of species to discover on the island still. Um, there's island scrub jay, the island night lizard, and then there's the fox. Um, I'm going to touch on the fox story just a little bit here. Um, how many of you know the island fox story and the recovery story behind it? Raise your hand, way high. Okay. Um, would any of you care to tell me what that story is in just a couple sentences? Success. It was a success. <laughs> that's and one word. That's good. Yeah, that's, 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 actually, like, that's actually a pretty good one. Um, it depends how you look at it, though. Okay. So the, the, the best available information just 10 years ago or 15 years ago was that the fox population was crashing okay, at the islands. And it took us a long time to figure out why it was crashing until we realized there was a population of golden eagles that established themselves at the islands. And the golden eagles were essentially eating all the foxes. It's really that simple. It's a predator-prey relationship. And then we brought the few last remaining few in captivity. So the, so the thought was that we had pig populations, and particularly on Santa Rosa. And those pig populations were large enough to really sustain this golden eagle population. And we thought that the fox population is probably not large enough to sustain the golden eagle population. So if you didn't have these non-native animals, you probably wouldn't have had the predators stay out there and knock the fox population to a low level. Okay? That theory still sort of stands. We still think that's why. We don't know if there were ever golden eagles out of the islands in the past, but we do know from fossil records that at the turn of the, this last ice age, golden eagles were the, the most abundant, um, or we think they're the most abundant uh, avian predator in, in California. So there were huge numbers of gold eagles back in the day. Okay? When humans started arriving in California, they got shot, they got poisoned, uh, now they're getting hit by wind turbines. So gold eagles are having a pretty hard time here. All right? So they made up the islands, they ate all the foxes. We were already on the, on the books to kind of get rid of the pigs and the non-native animals, so, so that's the food source for them. Foxes were brought into captivity, um, they were bred, successful release, okay? and now we have foxes on the islands again. Okay? We have a, situation now where the fox population, they don't have any predators out there. And so those populations are high and we're in a drought. And so resources are very low for the foxes. And the fox population is actually so high now where it's actually going down a little bit. All right, we think it's due to starvation. Or we, we're almost 100% sure it's due to starvation. So those are natural population cycles. That all sounds great, all right? Except we do know from a recent paper that came out just a couple years back in 2015, somebody did some genetic work on the foxes took samples from all the islands that have foxes, so that's San Nicolas, San Clemente, Catalina. If you remember, those islands are way far offshore. Santa Rosa and San Miguel. And found, all right, and those populations are all a little bit different, okay? But we trace them back to the mainland populations, and we are pretty sure they were bought out there around 7,000 years ago, give, give or take a few thousand years ago, okay? And we think they were transported, especially those outer islands, nearly for sure, by the Chumash, the Native Americans. Okay, so there's this, this sort of dog-human interaction type of thing. So here's the Park Service. So you remember the Park Service started 100 years ago, and what were we doing in Yosemite and Yellowstone when people came to visit? Anybody know what people did with the bears 100 years ago? They fed them. The rangers fed the bears. That was entertainment. All right, you go to those parks now, what are you, what are you told? Don't, Don't feed, feed the bears. bears. Okay. So I'm going to go back and sort of conservation, how we've sort of viewed how we think 
things are supposed to work when we're conserving an area for the future. All right, and so the Park Service has definitely changed how it's dealt, dealt with things. So here we are, we just saved the foxes. We did, now have learned that the foxes were nearly positively brought out by the Chumash. It is still possible that they could have made it out to the Santa Rosa and San Miguel, which were one large island, and they could have swam out there or rafted out there, but it's almost nearly impossible or highly unlikely they made it out to those other islands. So on islands, what you have is high rates of extinction and high rates of speciation. So these animals, after 7,000 years, have already speciated, and they're, little, they're different subspecies. There's morphological characteristics and how they've adopted those, adapted those islands based on the climate, the food sources, and those sorts of things. But now we have this fox out there. And the fox is the biggest predator on the islands. Okay? So what's another group of species that is doing, having a really difficult time in recent human history? All right? whole group of species, there's a lot of things that are having a hard time in human history. Seabirds. Seabirds are being hammered by almost every component of human activity. The islands are the only places where a lot of these seabirds are able to, to nest. And foxes are a big predator on seabirds. Okay? So here we have humans come along 10,000 years ago, 13,000 years ago the islands. And then they put foxes out there. And now as a group of people, we're scrambling all over the world to try and save the last few seabird colonies that are left, and seabirds are knocked down. But now we have the species that we just saved on islands that we know is brought out there by humans, not by European humans, and they're having a negative impact on seabirds. So what's the next step? Do we get rid of the foxes? All right. I'm going to throw that out there because it really completes the whole story and how we think about conservation biology and what our actions are and how they change over time as we get new pieces of information. Question. Could you get rid of the foxes on all the islands but one? <laughs> Good question. So there was actually proposals years ago to, to people have realized this for years that the foxes are having, having a negative impact on islands. And it was a theory for a long time that the Chumash probably brought them to the outer islands. We're, we're, we're now got some more evidence that, that suggests that. And so they thought about fencing off half island, which is really hard to do, to try and do an experiment to say that. You know what? Um, I don't think we're even close to getting rid of foxes from one island. All right, because the public perception on foxes is they're cute and furry and wonderful and adorable and nobody wants to get rid of them. Okay? If it was a slug out there eating all the seabirds, I don't think you'd have a problem at all. Okay? But the way humans approach and the way we think about animals has changed dramatically in the last 100 years. Okay? People were more acceptance of killing animals 100 years ago than they are today, whether it's native or non-native, whether it's causing harm or good, it doesn't really matter. So it's again, it's this context of how humans are changing socially over time and how we look at the environment, how we look at the controls we have. Um, I threw in a video here on the human population because I think it helps kind of put conservation biology in perspective. Because we're, we're in a tough time. So we're in a really tough time right now and it's probably not going to get better and it, we have to pick and choose what we can try and manage and manage well. So we'll leave the terrestrial environment, go to the uh, marine world, and um, you get through the intertidal zone. I'm not going to talk too much about the inter actually, I'm not going to talk at all about the intertidal um, zone, which is a whole other um, realm. <coughs> We've got a long-term monitoring program. Cal State Channel Islands is involved in setting up new intertidal plots on Santa Rosa Island to give students an opportunity and actually can, can follow through with some of the long-term monitoring. Um, and so we have plots in the intertidal up here on the left. Those are what the black abalone population used to look like when I started working, or I started going out in the park in the 1980s. They were stacked on top of each other. That species is now an endangered species. Okay. Not because of human take, but because of a disease event that happened. Um, USDA particle, sea stars, I'll talk a lot about sea star populations. I'll talk about the subtidal ones um, underwater. Um, but I will talk about the intertidal, but the same thing relates to, to them as well. They are, they are coming back, and then there's um, surf grass beds and, and other really important habitats. All right, then we get to the uh, underwater part of the world, which is what I'm going to sort of concentrate a lot of the, the talk about, um, and use examples of. And we have over 2,000 species in the marine world, um, and then we don't know of one today that's endemic. All right? And I throw that in there because, again, you have your island biology where animals get out there, they stay out there, they have high rates of speciation, high rates of extinction. In the water, it's one big giant ocean. Things move around a whole lot. Things are much more on a, on a sporadic, um, 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 sort of a, a chaos approach of how things recruit and, 
and conditions being right for them. Um, then there's all these organisms such as the seabirds like pelicans and seagulls and seals and sea lambs that use both the marine and the terrestrial environment. And islands are super, super important for them as well. And again, they use the mainland in a few places, but not to the extent they did 100 years ago because if you look down our coast, you see nothing but houses now. All right, we've essentially populated the coastal areas that, that they have. And people bring their dogs out there, and dogs chase seabirds and pinnipeds and whatnot. And so the coastal, our coast here is not really very friendly for wildlife today. A little bit about jurisdiction. So Channel Islands National Park was set up in 1980. Um, and then our our marine, our marine control goes out one mile. Um, when the Park Service was established, we tried to gain ownership of the living marine resources. So all the kelp plants, all the fish that was out from one, one, the shore to, to one mile. The state of California owns all along the coast out to three miles, and they also own around the islands. They told the Park Service, no, 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 no. That's our resource. They took us to the Supreme Court. We lost and the state owns and manages the resources. So the Park Service has no say in how we manage the living and resources. Pretty frustrating, that's what I do for the Park Service. Then you're probably scratching, well, the Park Service has no jurisdiction, why are you doing anything? Okay, and I'll give you some examples of why we do things. And I threw in some slides that I just had to put some summary slides together for another workshop I was just at, at the end, which will kind of give you some benefits or some, some things that have come out of the, the monitoring program in the last 30 years. Um, and then the sanctuary came along around 1980 as well, and their jurisdiction goes out six miles, and really the only regulation they have is you can't disturb the seafloor, so you can't drill for oil, you can't mine, um, you can't dig down into the substrate. Okay? But you have two federal agencies and a state agency now overlapping each other. You can probably imagine a bit of confusion and disjunction, especially when the public goes out there, not understanding what all the regulations are, because there are some very building regulations. Um, overall, it's a really good working environment, um, but of course the Park Service, when we're trying to preserve and protect and not have any commercial activities, conflicts with the state of California, which is trying to support recreational and commercial activities, and so there's some conflict of interest there as well. We also have DOD on San Miguel, or at least influencing San Miguel. On the, on the island, yeah, and actually they affect the water a little bit as well. <clears throat> From the islands, we have 18 million people in a 200-mile in a um, Area and you got to remember half that area is, is water, so it really it's a it's huge concentration of people, and those people have an impact on the islands. I put this in this morning, so I'm going to to change change the the topic. We'll see if I can download this. This is will this play the sound in here? Yeah, I'm just going to just so hyper to play. So it's a video that somebody sent me recently, and it's really just about human population growth. And really, one of the main focuses of my talk today is to try and put things in perspective, okay? And I'm not doing it because there's an age difference between you and I. I'm doing it because over the 27 years at the park, and I'll, and I'll show you a bunch of examples, my perspective has changed gradually. And it's this, this concept of shifting baseline. Um, and I think I used to know a lot about how change happened in Kelp Forest 10 years ago, 15 years ago. I thought we could explain most of our data. And after this recent warm water event, this El Nino and Blob that you've all heard about, we're looking at cycles that are greater than 35 years. So as you collect more information, you start to learn that your perspective is a bit off. And it's amazing how many times I have jumped to conclusions with our data set, yet to realize that, oh, those aren't the right conclusions, or the perspective really is not the right place. So I think the video of human population growth, since humans, um, developed as a species in Africa 200,000 years ago, is something to keep in mind in how you view every aspect of your life. Not just from an environmental perspective, but from a social perspective and everything else. We are in a really fast changing time. There's some amazing pressures. So <clears throat> I do think that's important as a perspective of where we are today, um, especially in the, in, in the science of conservation biology. Um, Really, it's a, it's a new science, and we're trying to figure out how to adapt as our population increases and how to protect things. Um, and just like the Park Service has changed dramatically in 100 years and how it views things, and it's, it's going to be a, a progressive type of thing. So if you're going to go into the sciences and you're going to go to the field, I mean, really, it's, it's, it's your generation that's going to try and be innovative and try and figure out how to save the last remaining space and try and improve what we've already had impacts on.
So not an easy task. Um, so with all those people close to the islands, we have impacts such as trash. Um, luckily, I don't think trash has a huge impact here, in my own personal opinion. Um, it's an eyesore. I don't like to see it. Um, it's a gruesome reminder of how sloppy we are as humans on the mainland because the beaches at the islands are full of trash. Um, and I actually think that we've gone downhill in the last um, 30 or 40, 30 years since really the 70s with trash. If you were around in the 70s, and, and Sean, I'm sure, remembers this, there was this big, we had a huge trash problem in this country. People were polluting rivers and streams, sort of like where, not, not to degrade China, but sort of where China is today, and the people there are opposing those things, and they're cleaning up their act as the population grows. But we used to throw everything on the ground, everything in the rivers, everything in the, in the ocean, and then the 69 oil spill happened, and people had sort of this environmental awareness. One of the things that came out of that in the 70s was this huge campaign of throwing your trash away in a trash can. And you didn't go anywhere in the 70s without seeing photos of people putting trash where it belongs, in the trash can. And today, do you see many of those photos? Maybe at an uh, airport, <laughs> OK? That campaign was all over this country and everywhere. So I think pretty much it's been forgotten. And I think today people are throwing more stuff out of their car windows, mm -hmm. more stuff on the ground. Um, for a number of reasons, and it ends up, unfortunately, in places like the islands. Question? I was about to say, I saw an example that, like, I think uh, back in, during spring break this year, we, me and my dad and brother, we were going up north to visit family, and we were stuck in traffic, and some, we saw some guy throw, like, a beer bottle out the window, and what he didn't know is there was a cop behind him, two, down, <laughs> two uh, cars down, and we saw him go get him, that's hilarious. Awesome, beer bottle, even better. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, it's, it's, I think it's actually commonplace today as it was pre-1970 for people to throw things away. Uh, I'm hoping that all of you, none of you do it and you're, you're a bit more educated than that. But, but there was a huge campaign push in the 70s that we have now, I think, forgotten. So we're due, I think, for those campaigns again. So it's just amazing how we have to remind humans how to behave in a society or what's appropriate or not appropriate, um, even as simple of a concept of, of, of trash. I would just say that, so we have uh, some grants to work on this with the park and elsewhere. And if you guys are interested in looking at marine debris, that's the, we have several students working on those projects. It's an opportunity for you guys to get involved. And also we're doing a lot with microplastics, the smaller pieces of trash that you can see that actually I think you should be very worried about. Yeah. You should be worried about. But yeah. that's not the macroscopic stuff. Yeah, and, and Sean's completely right. The microplastic thing is, is, a, is a, with the new science, it's a new awareness, and there's plastic everywhere. Um, Luckily, what I was saying is impacts. We don't have a whole lot of birds and turtles here that are eating these things. Um, turtles, for sure, possibly as they come visit, but we don't see dead birds like albatross on islands full of cigarette lighters and balloons and whatnot. So it's great that way. But there are definitely some impacts, impacts of trash. Um, and then the microplastic thing, we are learning through a lot of the work that's being done here and, and a few other places. You know what the impacts are of, of animals ingesting those things. We we've, we've not found a single fish. Or single well, crabs, but we've not we have to find a single fish that doesn't have plastics in their gut, from down deep, from in salt marshes, everywhere. For example, and certainly every piece of sediment we've sampled has plastics on it across the planet. So it's a thing. So this is uh, a picture just from a couple of years ago out in the water. So we have east winds. All those balloons that we were taught to release as kids end up either in my two favorite places, the desert or the ocean. <laughs> surrounding, surrounding LA. I did it when I was a kid as well. So I always like to throw this one out. So my, I'm actually going to try and pass a bill when I retire <laughs> in California, and it's going to be a one cent tax or one percent tax on balloon sales. And I'm hopefully I'll get paid to go in the ocean and the desert and go pick up people's balloons. Right? It's a fantasy. Of mine. <laughs> probably won't happen, but whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's all these other types of activities we have in the channel which have impacts. And, and uh, all of you know about the 1969 oil spill. Have you studied that? Uh, in our coastal class, have you guys talked about it in Collins Bio yet? No. no? Okay, so there was an oil spill in Santa Barbara Channel. These are actually the oil rigs off Santa Barbara um, that blew up in 69, and it was the first major oil spill in the world. And it essentially altered the whole environment. It, it actually started the environmental movement in the U.S. And, and, and around the world, so it was an oil spill that did that. But lots of activities. So shipwrecks, we have the oil drilling operations, we got a lot of air pollution. So it's a big, a big deal. We're trying to clean that up now. Um, this is a photo that I was just on the boat last week with Keenan, who's one of our staff, who came in professionally and I asked him to send me this. He sent it to me at 9 o'clock last, last night. But there's the iconic Anacapa Arch with an oil platform in it and a shipping tanker. So 
I could probably get rid of all these other photos now. I'll just toss that in this morning. So, <laughs> and I thank Keenan. I said, is your name big enough? <laughs> anyway, so anyways, I'll see if I get a copy of that one. It's the name on it. <laughs> and then there's the other activities. If you're, if you're dealing with marine resources, really the biggest activity that's harmful is the actual take of, of animals. So we've got recreational and, and, um, and sport and commercial fishing at the Channel Islands. Um, one of the reasons why the state took the Park Service to court in 1980 was back then they realized how valuable the resources are on the islands. So the islands compose only 3% of the coastline in the state of California, yet we provide well over 15% of the fish caught in all of California. So you're talking about a highly productive area with a small amount of area in the state. If you're really interested in promoting fisheries, you're not going to want to give that up to some organization who doesn't want to promote commercial, commercial interests. Um, so, in, I thought the next photo was different. Um, from those fishing, from those fishing, um, from those fishing uh, activities, there's a lot of. All right. There's a lot of activities that um, are have inadvertent or bycatch um, issues. Um, this is gill net fishery. Um, gill nets were actually banned in California by um, voters in 1992. Um, the ban worked that it was not legal to fish outside of the three mile state water zone along the mainland, but only one mile at the islands. We don't really understand the, the rationale behind that yet today, or it was for rationale. And the state still manages a gillnet fishery. It just happens outside of state waters, which is a bit confusing as well. So it happens in federal waters. The state permits the fishery. And there's still a lot of huge impacts. And, and I have something to remind me. I'll try to get to the next, the next lecture here. I'll try to get some of the stats on gillnet fishery. Because there is a lot of bycatch. There is a lot of, um, of uh, impact on, on species such as black sea bass, um, which I'll talk a bit about later. And then there's um, trap fisheries, crab and, and lobster pots, and here's a cormorant. There were several in this trap here that was abandoned, and there's an abandoned trap that's killing lobsters, which just continue to fish because they don't self-destruct like they're supposed to. So what are the two largest fisheries in California? Or two, one of them is the largest fishery, and one of them is now downgraded to one of the 10 largest fisheries. Anybody guess? Squid. Squid, you got it. All right, number one fishery. Okay. How many of you have eaten squid? Calamari. Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you like squid? That was good. How many of you have eaten squid, ca fried calamari rings and tentacles in Ventura Harbor? Okay. A bunch of us. There's like, three places that will serve rings and, and, and um, tentacles. If you go to Andrew's Seafood, they do the big giant strips, and those are Humboldt squid. They come from Mexico, most likely. Um, so most years in Ventura, Half the squid land in, Cal in California, which is over 100, and I think this will be over $150 million fishery, um, will be landed in Ventura. All three of those places that you buy squid there, that squid was shipped to China, processed, and shipped back. Okay. So if you think this is a relatively sustainable fishery, think about the energy costs. And it's just because labor is so expensive here, and it's a very labor intensive process. So pretty amazing to think about how we're moving seafood across the world via shipping just to get processed and then ship back for us to consume. All right, the other fishery with sea urchins, this is now probably beat out by things like lobster, not because there's more lobster, but because lobster are a much higher value today than they were 20 years ago. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that. You're about largest in terms of money, you mean? Money, yes. Yeah. Yeah, oh, actually, it's going to tonnage as well. OK. Um, so these are used to be all exported in Japan. Now they're about half consumed in the US. Um, so there's a, a fair amount of local people um, consuming it. How many of you eaten uni? Raise your hand. A few less. How many of you like uni? Raise your hand. <laughs> a few less. So if we look at the fisheries in California, this is a paper published in 2014. And the landing tickets, so the landing records by fishing game changed in 1980, so there's a little bit better information, which is why it starts there. This is also when our monitoring program started in 1982, so it's a good reference to the things that we study. And Essentially, the catch of uh, for the total value of fin fish, um, this is proportions, was really high. And so you had mostly fin fish caught in 1980 and very, very few invertebrates and black. And essentially now, 30 years later, most of our fishery is dominated by squid and urchins and lobster. It's mostly um, invertebrates and very, very low percentage of fin fish. And it's not because there are a lot of fin fish out there still to catch. It's because we caught all the fin fish. And now we're eating all the invertebrates. All right. If we look at um, 
this in, 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 in a graph form and in, in money in that really percent of total value. Again, it's um, you have this really high value tin fish adjusted for inflation, but worth a ton of money, 1.2 billion dollars. Okay, now those tin fish are only worth a fraction of that, a tenth of that, because again, it's not because fish are not worth a lot of money per pound, they're worth a ton of money per pound. Okay, it's because there's none left. There's been eaten all. Right, and then the vertebrates are increasing, and their value is, has increased as, uh, as well, just because that cash has increased so much, so dramatically. Right? In metric tons, you see a, a little bit of a different graph, but a similar type of pattern, where a lot more fin fish, all right, a lot fewer now. So it's not just the dollar value, it's actually the tonnage that's being removed. And it's not because we're fishing less, it's because there's no more fish left. And basal species. I'm going to talk about this species on the area at length. Uh, mainly because this is a good example of um, perception and what I think would happen and not happen at the Channel Islands in my 27-year career. Um, this is a species that showed up in, the, in, in California in around 2000, 2001, and it only made it out to Catalina and um, never made it out to the islands until last year. And I'll talk more about that later because I'm going to have you try to help me decide on what you think we should do with this species. Okay, this is the algae that's in your miso soup. So if you really want, you know, <coughs> Channel Islands Harbor is a relatively clean harbor. You want to go out and collect this and put it in your miso soup and not buy it dried in the store, you can do that. And then there's sargassum horneri, which um, I'll talk a little bit about here. This is an invasive species that first showed up in California in 2003, and it's now covering probably about 50% of the Anacapa and Santa Barbara Island all the past couple of years. So, the kelp forest at Anacapa today may not ever be the kelp forest that you could have seen 10 years ago. So, total bummer. Um, if you've never been diving, it won't matter too much to you, okay? <laughs> but it's important for you to understand that these things have changed. Um, and then they'll have large ecological consequences. We don't know what those are, though. Is this the same ones that's in the Channel Islands Harbor at the mouth that we see on the rocks? Ooh, uh, probably not. Different. Yeah, do you know what algae she's talking about? Uh, no, you, you're not talking about a sargassum, you're talking about brown algae, right? Yeah, it's this yeah, one, no, but it looks like that, but it's a long... Yeah, so that's probably a thing called feather boa kelp. If you, okay. if you look at a picture of that, you'll... Yeah, in the harbor, we have a lot of another sargassum, sargassum muticum, which was also introduced to California in, 19, in the 1970s, <laughs> and it boomed, in, it boomed just like this species did, and then sort of naturalizing became part of the environment, and we think the impact is eh, not as bad as we expected it to be in the beginning, we're kind of hoping that this algae does the same thing, but at this point, there's huge areas that are nothing but sargassum on Catalina and Santa Barbara and Anacapa. Okay. So here's how the sargassum horn invasion happened, 2003, and you're gonna have to see this slide again when I switch the end area, just because this is my talk. And 2006, it was seen at Catalina, 2007 at San Clemente, 2009, 2010, 13. 12, 13, and 2015. All right, so we're in this mass, just like the people took over the planet, okay? If you move, imagine sargassum over time, the last 10 years, sargassum is taking over the Channel Islands. It's really the same type of scenario, okay? Um, here's the percent cover of sargassum at the three different islands where we have it, and you can see, you know, relatively low levels when it was established, and just boom. And again, really similar to the human population invasion of the planet, okay? You have low level and then conditions are right and boom. In our case, a lot of it was technology and farming and whatnot, but, but still similar patterns. All right, so what are kelp forests? Take a step back here. The kelp forests are these stands of um, large brown algae in the order of laminary ice um, or kelps that provide food, habitat, and structure for a lot of other different animals. So really, they're just the trees of a forest. Um, if you can imagine a forest without trees, you don't have all the birds and everything else that lives, lives in them. Um, the structure's here, fast growing, hold fast, doesn't pick up nutrients, the whole plant will pick up nutrients, has the masses that keep the plant afloat, so this is a really good competitor when it comes to algae, because it floats up and shades out everything else, just like a tree does. And there's a high diversity of primary producers, so other algae, other plants that live in, in kelp forests, um, a lot of that is um, a very sporadic um, or, or um, very variable, as, it, as kelp will be torn out in the fall by wave actions, you open up light, light canopy, and a lot of these other ephemeral algaes and whatnot come in. So really high diversity, 
And then there's a really high diversity of, of consumers of kelps, anywhere from abalone to whales that feed on the mysids that live in the kelp beds and in between. There's a lot of abiotic factors, so not biological factors, that um, affect kelp. The nutrients, light, temperature, um, substrate. And um, there's a lot of biological factors that affect health, so such as actual grazers or cascading types of effects. Is the next slide? Where um, here's your predators here. If you remove the predators, such as sea otter, that eat sea urchins, you then have nothing but sea urchin dominated areas. I tell you the disease event, which is what happened this year, or last couple of years. If you have your predator that eats the sea urchins, you tend to have relatively more stable and healthier kelp forests with a lot of other predators that live in them. Um, the Channel Islands are a really neat place for kelp forests. So we have 20, um, there's 27 genera, there's nine uh, uh, Channel Islands. So you'll see a lot of photos of this algae. That's my favorite algae. I got rid of kelp from all my, all my uh, macro systems <laughs> from all my photos because I think this one's really cool. Um, it's a deep water. It lives in about 100 feet off Santa Cruz um, and San Clemente and Santa Barbara Island, but really small patches of it. It's not a very widespread algae. And so kelp distribution around the world, it's not just here in California. It likes cold, nutrient-rich water. So the Coriolis effect, the earth rotating this way, create, and, and the way the offshore winds work, creates a lot of upwelling on the west side of the continents, such as us and Chile and um, Africa, South Africa there. And then there's a lot of upwelling around here. So there's kelp forests all around the world. And, and we're talking really just uh, macrocystis as well as these other genre of kelp. So if we go to compare kelp forests and terrestrial forests, um, that's what these numbers are about. And I'll explain this to you. So these are dry kilograms of carbon, okay? There's production, so the dry kilograms are going to dry out how much these tropical rainforests and then these more temperate forests like in the Midwest and Canada and then kelp forests are per year you get these numbers here. So really high production of carbon, so a lot of fixation going on in rainforests and in kelp forests, and because you have much more slower growing periods in these other forests because they go dormant for half the year, or it's just cooler so the biological functions happen a bit slower, you have less production. So a really comparable behavior in kelp forests versus tropical rainforests. If you look at producer mass, and this is not per year, if you go down and chop a square meter of forest down, okay, Rainforests have these really big old trees that are fast growing. There's a lot of carbon, but so are these cooler forests as well. They got these really big trees, okay? And then a lot of mass in these forests in general because you get these big giant trees that are sitting around. A and kelp forests, you cut them down and you dry them out and it's all water, okay? So you have all this carbon being produced, but it's not there in the forest. So where does it go? The carbon is energy. It's a building block for everything else. So think about you have all this production, but nothing is in the forest. So it's getting used up really quickly. Mm -hmm. All right, and then litter mass, same in tropical rainforests, same in kelp forests, and then if you go in the Midwest where it's cool, you're gonna have a huge pile of litter mass that's decomposing slowly over time just because it's cold, it's got ice over it or snow over it for half the year, and it just takes a lot longer for things to decompose. All right, but in tropical rainforests, things hit the ground, it's moist, it's wet, and there's all kinds of critters and fungus and molds that consume an algae and, and get it into the food marsh. So where does it all go in kelp forest? So this is what makes kelp forest really unique and really different from these other forests, is it's really all about export, okay? So here you have your kelp forest here. A lot of this gets ripped up and becomes these giant rafts, which are floating all over Southern California. In Northern California, they get thrown offshore. Those rafts are extremely important for baby fish, maybe juvenile rockfish that settle out, and then they move to the bottom. So they're really important for these different life stages. Um, a lot of it ends up on the beach, so if you're not in Southern California where they groom the beaches, um, which is highly unfortunate, it's food for all these things like beach amphipods, which is food for all the birds. But again, with so many people on the beaches in Southern California, groomed, we don't have a lot of these, and we don't have a lot of these. And if there are those, there's usually dogs chasing them around, which is highly unfortunate. So our seabird populations really have no place to go except for the islands, and then our lower populated areas along the coast here. So islands are really important in that sense. Um, but that export component is really important. So why are, why are kelp forests at the Thailand Islands so unique and productive? I told you about how it was 3% of the coastline. It provided 15% of the fisheries. And that's really because the oceanographic conditions are really unique at the islands. Okay, there's other places in the world like this. 
Okay, but the channel lines are really unique in where we have this warm water from Baja, Mexico that come up. We have some equatorial water that comes in a lot this last couple of years from this, this blob, this warm water blob that came in. And then you get this cold water from Alaska that moves down the coast. So you have this one, we have this really, really, really high diversity of animals. This, this, this convergence where it's the southernmost range for these warm water species such as lobster, sheep, and Garibaldi. So Garibaldi are California state marine fish. You go to Anacapa, you go to Santa Cruz, you look down the water, and you're going to see these bright orange goldfish. Those are Garibaldi. You go to San Miguel, and you won't see them. I've seen one at San Miguel in 27 years. So 50 miles of coast, San Miguel here, Santa Barbara here, abundant here, extremely rare there. Okay? Huge differences in the biogeography of these islands. And then there's these cold water species, such as sunflower stars and the rockfish, all right, which are really abundant up in the cooler water, but are much less abundant here in the warmer water. So really dynamic place to study. In some ways, that's great because there's change all the time, and we see these big effects of El Nino and La Ninos. In some ways, it's bad because there's change all the time, and so there's a lot of noise in the system that's really natural. It's not good or bad. It's just part of the system. And I'll be talking about that later. Um, then there's all these things like this, the Santa Barbara Channel Eddy. Um, this is the Eddy and the Santa Barbara background. Um, and it was originally thought that this lobster population here these lobsters, all the reproduction that happened in the Channel Islands, those larvae were exported and never ended up anywhere. They just died. Right? And that's because lobster larvae live for 13 months, 11 to 13 months before they settle out. So can you imagine being in the water column and hoping you make it to shore before you settle out and become an adult? So if you have all these water masses that are getting carried everywhere, that's something that probably not, they're not going to end up that way. So we thought all of our larvae were coming from down here. But now we've discovered that there's this retainment of water in the channel through this eddy. This is relatively recent, recent information in the last 10 years. And so that theory is kind of on the, on the, on the table now again. We don't really know what's happening with lobster larvae. So pretty amazing. Here you have one of the most lucrative and important fisheries along the west coast in Mexico and Baja. And we don't know anything about the life cycle of the species. We know very little about the natural history. You know, I like to tell people we know more, more about water on Mars than how our systems <laughs> work here on the planet. So I guarantee if we threw billions of dollars at these questions, like lobster, we'd be able to figure out probably what happened to them. But there's very, very little funding for biological sciences. All right, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, so I told you, I'm kind of all over the map. Hopefully, it'll make sense at the end um, about sort of why we have an inventory monitoring program. And I got to take a step back and what the mission of the Park Service is. I think all of you know what the mission of the Park Service is. Um, preserve and protect for future generations. Um, inspiration um, in science and there's a few other things. When Channel Islands was established, it had specific legislation in there to protect natural, significant, scenic wildlife, marine, archaeological, cultural, blah, 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 but not, including, but not limited to the following. And so there are these specific things, cycles, bound pelicans, pinnipeds, the caliche, these fossil forests, the his, the both um, recent history and past history of the islands were really unique. and. You know, those were sort of the central focus points, okay? But around 1980, the Park Service was realizing that there were these changes happening. When you flood Yosemite Valley with millions of people and everybody has a campfire, your air quality degrades and your quality of, for the visitor actually degrades and there's resource impacts, you know, people walking around the General Sherman tree, these big trees. And the Park Service realized we better start monitoring these things because we don't have any data. So. And people forget what was there 20 years ago or 10 years ago and what's there now. So they started this inventory and monitoring program. When Channel Islands was established, this was actually in the legislation by Congress, to understand population dynamics and trends of terrestrial marine ecosystems. This is this baseline information, just documenting change over time. And then for, to provide visitor use on a low intensity, limited entry basis, basis to ensure negligible adverse impact to park resources. This is very unusual in Park Service legislation because we're also supposed to promote recreation. Now, this isn't well defined. This is a contentious statement today. Are all the people going out to visit the research station too many for Santa Rosa Island? Okay, when really it was for the resources and not for people. And so, I'm not saying that's actually the case. I'm just giving it as an example. Now we have thousands of visitors going to Santa Cruz. So we're constantly managing these things. It's no different than feeding the bears or not feeding the bears. It's a constant dynamic of this cost-benefit analysis that the Park Service has to do. It's very challenging. 
This is a hot topic of discussion. So, but B is why I have a job. This is why I get to talk to you today. <laughs> so, um, and I hope it will continue forever, but you never know. Things change. Um, so ecology, if you think about it from medicine, we're really in the 17th century relative medicine. I told you, we don't have a clue really how lobsters, where the lobster larvae are coming from that populate the Channel Islands. We don't know. We have some theories, but none of them is really tested. We don't have the genetics on it. Um, there's really no, people have asked the question, there's just nobody's been funded to do it. So ecology is really, we're 300 years behind um, what we discover in humans when we just try to figure out how the heart pumps blood through the streets, through the body as a circulatory system. So really we're at this infant stage. People always expect me to know everything about everything. And I like to throw this up there because we're really at this stage of, we're just learning. And our ideas and concepts as we get more data, best available data, change over time. So the internal monitoring program, this is, was designed to look at these things, identify trends in ecosystem health. Health is a really strange term. Um, determine limits of variability, diagnose abnormal conditions, and suggest potential remedial treatments. And I say ecosystem health is a strange concept because at the Channel Islands, we removed sea otters 130 years ago with the Russian and French fur trade. They're a top predator. We know they have a cascading effect. So you can say just to remove all those, we have unhealthy kelp for us. The system's not healthy. Okay. But as a biologist and talking to the public and managers, nobody wants to hear that things are unhealthy. They want to know how things, good things are, not always how bad things are. So it's a really strange concept. It's a struggle to try and give that as a, as a relationship to both the managers as well as the public. Right? The program was originally not designed to answer questions. So in a scientific study, you have a hypothesis. All right, that you're going to go test, you do experimental treatments that help you get to that hypothesis. The inventory monitoring program of the Park Service is really to go out there and count things. So if I was to come in this classroom, everyone in Claire's classes, and I was going to count the number of students, and slowly that increased, or slowly that declined, I might come to a conclusion in 10 years, whether that was good or bad. Okay? But that's all we do, we count things. All right. 37 years, or 35 years now of counting things, kind of boring. Okay? But we can tell a lot from the county now. We're learning a lot that other people don't have. And we have a lot of people that come to us for data to put their scientific study in perspective. Okay? So if I was going to come to this room, what a lot of ecologists did, take a picture of this room, and I said, well, this was the real world happening. Okay? And I based all my questions based on this scenario, and I decided some sort of hypothesis to, to test those questions, and I did an experiment, that would all be great. But 10 years ago, this room was empty. But taking a picture today, I would never know that. So really, it's having that baseline of information of how things change over time. And I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll pound this in your head data. So there's the shifting baseline component of how ecologists look at the world, how people look at the world, and it's really the then and now. Okay? And 50 years ago, people used to catch black sea bass everywhere. They were in every one of our kelp forests here. There were lots of them, these big 500-pound fish. Okay? If you're a spear fisherman, you swim up to them and you spear them. They just sit there and they say hello to you. They're pretty easy to catch. In the 70s, they all disappeared. We caught them all. Okay? For 20 years, there was virtually none observed in, in Southern California. And in the 90s, they started making a comeback. And now we see a few. Um, and it's just a few. And it looks like that population is sort of stabilized at a very, very low level. Um, we have a bite catch for them. Um, a bite catch fishing for them. Here's one here that was called off Belita. It's illegal to catch these. This fish is dead, okay? This person never saw one before. They didn't know what it was. So they still took it. Illegally, so you get busted. You gotta know what, you gotta know what you're catching. Um, but I grew up fishing since I was five, and I watched the resources that I used to go fish at go from a lot of big fish this big to a whole lot of little fish this big in the years and the ages between five and 13 when I used to fish at San Clemente Island. So I watched it change in an eight year period, fishing with my dad four or five months out of the year. So pretty amazing what an impact um, sport fishermen can have, and then commercial as well. So this is some photos of a landing area in Florida, and this is 1960 with the fish that people used to catch, 2007, and now 2013. This is the same landing area, different boats. So pretty amazing, it's a shifting baseline. So if you start fishing today, there's your big fish. Okay, that was not a big fish then, and not a big fish then. And it's this shifting baseline, this is not just in the biological world. This is, is how we deal with things socially. So think about the human population change and how we're dealing with population growth and how we look and view society and people in general. It's this constant shifting baseline. And I'll talk more about this with some of the data sets. 